Thank you, Andreas, for the nice introduction, for the kind words, um, and uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, it's a big pleasure for me to speak here uh, in front of so many people and also to have a bit more time. Usually we speak like 15 to 20 minutes and actually having the time to speak uh, a slot of an hour is, is, is cool. And we also have a, a short or like let's say 20 minutes of um, Q&A session after the presentation. So whatever comes up during the presentation, just remind it and uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, so today I'd like to speak about a world where everybody can fly every time and anywhere they want. Um, and this world is a world where traffic jams are basically a thing of the past, where flying is as normal as taking a taxi. Um, and this might sound like a bit of a science fiction fantasy or like a childhood dream, but let me explain to you why this world is actually much closer than, than you might think, um, and also what we at Lilium are working on to make that, work ha to make that world happen. So first of all, at Lilium, we are building an electric VTOL jet. So what is an electric VTOL jet? VTOL means vertical takeoff and landing. Um, that, that means although you can fly forward like an airplane, at takeoff and at landing, you basically land and take off like a helicopter. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you have the flexibility of an, of an helicopter, you don't need runways, but you have the speed and the efficiency of an aircraft. So in our case, the goal of the product that we're building right now is a five-seater. So that means when we have a pilot on board in the beginning, um, you still have four seats and can travel with your family. And we think that this is basically the transportation or the means of transportation of the future. And why is this? It's gonna be as cheap as a train. It is as quiet as a fan. It can go up to speeds of 300 kph and, a range of, and can cover a range of 300 kilometers. Um, on top of that, the operation itself is CO2 neutral because it's all electric um, and the operation is gonna be simple and safe. So how, how is this gonna look like? like? How will you as a customer or as a, as a citizen, how are you gonna get in contact with this technology? So it's not gonna be the way that you own a car today, it's gonna be a ride-sharing service um, and an on-demand transportation service. So Lilium is not just about building this Lilium jet, which of course we started out with and which is of course a big part of the development right now, but at, in parallel, we're already building the service structure, talking to partners and basically working towards that when market entry happens, when the aircraft is ready, we also have the infrastructure and the, the processes and the operations ready to launch a service. So you're not gonna own a jet, you're gonna book one, you take out your smartphone, you use it like my taxi or Uber, you basically say where you wanna go, where you wanna get picked up, um, and then you summon a jet and um, it, will take, it will pick you up at a, at a nearby landing spot. And all of this, like I said in the beginning, of the, comparable to the cost of a train, um, if it's more on demand and on routes that are too high frequently um, traveled, it's comparable to the cost of a taxi. So let's look at a use case, what that actually means in real life. So here's one of the routes that I, that I probably, or that's one of the most frequently traveled routes in the world and also well known. Imagine you have to go from Manhattan downtown to JFK International Airport. So today, taking a taxi takes you roughly an hour, and it costs a bit more than 50, Euro, uh, 50 dollars. With the Lilium jet, it costs the same, but it only takes you five minutes. Of course, you have to add to this getting to the landing pad, that, and that also depends on, of course, how many landing pads you can actually build in a city. But in Manhattan, where everything is quite densely uh, accumulated around, around the downtown area, you could basically have, let's say, three uh, three landing pads on each, each side of, the, of Manhattan, and then it takes you maybe 10 minutes to get there, and then only five minutes for the actual distance that the taxi needs roughly an hour for. Um, so this is an example of what a lily, lily pad, or in this case more a hub, could look like. So you could have actually leverage the rooftops that we already have in most cities, like the rooftops of big buildings are flat anyway. So imagine you have a hub like this where Every, every minute a Lilium jet lands and gets, uh, takes off, and then you also have like a little 
a little launch here where you can wait and it's all branded in that service so that you've got a smooth user experience. So for us, it's really important that it's not just an aircraft that in itself has a good design and a good user experience, but that the whole service is actually what you, what you know from basically services like Uber where you, where you don't have to worry about all the interconnections. You, you, your interface is an app and then the whole interface with the real world, with launches and the pilot and so on, is designed to be as smooth as basically operating with that app. Before we go into a bit more detail on what that plane is actually looking like in a bit more technical detail and also I want to talk to, we'll talk to you about a bit more about the founding story and how we got where we are now. Um, let's have a look at the, the prototype that we've actually been flying for a bit over a year. Um, it's a one-to-one, uh, one -one, so a full-scale prototype. This design um, is still a two-seater, so in the beginning we, were, we set out to build a two-seater, and when we kind of skipped that step and said, okay, we want to get to market um, with that on-demand service right from the beginning, we decided to go five-seater from, from the start. Um, and so this is still the two-seater design. The rest of the slides where you see the graphics, um, that's already the five-seater design which, which we are working on right now. So this is a flight. Um, it might be some of, the, some of these, some, or some shots of this flight are also on the, on the official uh, website or the, the YouTube video, but this is an unedited flight, so you can't see this anywhere else but here now. Um, and let's have a look how that looks like. it takes off vertically, basically like you know it from a helicopter, but you don't have any open rotors or anything that kind of lets you see how it generates thrust. So that's kind of a nice thing that it, it basically takes off like something you know from Star Wars or Star Trek. And then it has this uh, seamless transition where it tilts the flaps forward. And then it accelerates. And the nice thing, this is a transition flight, so we haven't really gone with this in this flight. We are not flying faster than, I think this is like 50 kph, where it's really the low speed flight. But the interesting bit about this is, even in low speed, where most of the transition concepts have re well, really struggle um, being maneuverable, we can basically fly all the maneuvers, climbs, descends, turns. Okay, now the cameraman has kind of lost it. Put it again. Yeah, and that's back transition, so now we're hovering again. And then you can basically turn on the spot to point the nose where you want. And still seeing this, my adrenaline level goes a bit up because I was actually the one flying this thing from the ground. Um, so that was always very, very impressive when this, this full-scale prototype is actually when you can command it like you're flying an RC plane. Um, for almost half a year, these were the happiest moments when it actually touched down and we knew everything worked. Thank you. All right, then let's look at the plane in a bit more detail. I already mentioned it can take off vertically and it can transition, so how is this happening? So we saw in the video already, we have these flaps, right? So in each of the wings, we have a, we have a main wing and we have a canal wing, uh, and the canal wing is half the size in terms of the flap and the, um, and the engine um, numbers. Um, and each of the flaps, so always three fans are clustered in one flap, and then they can all be tilted. They can be tilted basically vertically, then you generate thrust as in a rocket, you take off vertically, and then you tilt these fans and you can imagine the thrust vector just basically pushes you forward gradually, and at some point, or actually not at some point, but gradually you also gain more lift, uh, so airborne lift from the, from the actual aero surfaces. So the canard, the body itself, because it's also shaped in a wing shape, um, and the, the main wings, they're all producing um, airborne lift and already through transition. So it's not like you have to go through transition and, and at some point the, the aerodynamic lift enters. It's actually a smooth process and that also means, and I have a slide for this later, that you are maneuverable throughout the whole transition phase. Um, and what that also means, because you can transition in forward flight, you're much more efficient than, let's say, the, the open rotor hover concepts, for example, because in these concepts you always have to generate lift 
um, with your propulsion system all the time in our case, or in basically in all the transition uh, VTOL cases, um, you leverage the, the aerodynamic lift. Um, and that makes the plane very efficient. Um, so efficient that we can go, with current battery technology, we can go to ranges up to 300 kilometers um, and also fly top speeds of 300 kph. And to give that, or put that in perspective, um, the energy consumption of a Lilium jet in cruise flight is comparable to an electric car on the motorway. So why do we think, on the last slide you see, uh, we, we put a, um, the smartest approach in the sector. Why do we think this? Why do we think that of all the VTOL concepts that are out there, why do we think that our concept is basically the, the, the smartest approach there? Um, and one of the key aspects is its simplicity. Um, and the simplicity is not in one component or not in, in one detail of the propulsion system. It's the simplicity in the whole aircraft concept. So what that means is we only have these tiltable flaps, nothing else. We have the propulsion system is basically engines, 36 engines, and 12 flaps that we can move. And these basically two mechanisms, thrust and directing the thrust, and not just the thrust, but also they act as aero surfaces as well, as control surfaces. With only these two mechanisms, um, and they're also bundled in one mechanical part, which is also nice for testability, for example. This means with just this one concept, uh, we can basically cover all the manu maneuverability, we can cover the transition case, um, and that means compared to other concepts, for example, we don't need um, pitchable, um, or variable pitch propellers, for example. We don't need a tail because we can use the propulsion system to stabilize the aircraft. We don't have gearboxes. We just, I have another slide for the, for the actual engine. There's no gearboxes involved to throttle down a high-speed uh, high electric motor down to the high torque and slow movement of an open rotor, for example. Um, we don't need folding propellers because we're using the same, the same propulsion system for takeoff, also for cruise flight. Um, and no rudder, no tail, and no water cooling. That's also a thing if you have more complex systems, and a lot of competitors have complex systems where you do need water cooling to actually get the heat out. In our case, since we use these ducted fans, we can really use um, the airflow to cool our motors and um, also the servos in the, in the, in the flap for the flap movement. So this is a slide on the, on the actual engine. So of course, when you develop a, an aircraft concept that is so new or no one can actually build or has built parts for this, um, of course, we had to develop the engine ourselves as well. So the engine is, an, is a ducted fan. We call them electric jets jet engines. Um, I know that there's a kind of, in, especially in aerospace, there's a kind of a discussion around whether we're allowed to call it jet, um, since it's not a turbine, and usually a turbine is called a jet, but f just from the meaning of the word itself, imagine a jet ski is also called jet. It's just a very fast stream of fluid, um, and so this is why we call them electric jet engines, also because jet sounds much cooler than ducted fan. <laughs> um, so what is, what is the good thing about this instead of, uh, or compared to open rotors? Um, so they can be low noise because we have actually, we have options to damp, we have options to design the plate in a way that we can make them really low noise. Um, and also the, like the biggest thing about the duct is that it contains blade loss. So imagine these big open rotors. Um, I don't know if any one of you ever took a flight with a helicopter, but. I recently did, and it's actually quite scary when you walk to it and it's already rotating above your head. Like, you, you always go there like this, although you can never reach it, but it, it, it's just intimidating that there's such a big moving force um, that you can see and that you could feel the airflow from. So in our case, and that's also about the user experience that, that I was mentioning, the, what we call the magical user experience, that you don't really see what is creating the thrust and you don't really get intimidated or scared by any big moving parts. And containing blade loss actually means if there is something, let's say a bird strike or whatever, whatever occasion where a blade really gets lost, in an open rotor design, that blade just, well, flies anywhere. Um, and it can, can, it can harm bystanders, it can harm in, uh, passengers, it can actually also damage the plane. So that's why our ducted fans are designed in a way that this can never happen. 
So the, the duct around it is as strong as you need it to contain a plate loss. And low vibration is also one of the things. The open rotors always have these, um, these, this, you know, there's this low frequency that you hear when, even from far away when you have a helicopter. Um, this is also something that we don't have in, in the jet engines here. And that also means for the passengers themselves, it's a very low vibrating uh, or low vibration feeling. Um, and also these ducted fans are basically key of the high range and the high speed because they, they are specifically optimized for forward flight, which means of course in, in the hover flight, we're not as efficient as big open rotors, but we don't have to be there for long. That's the, that's the nice thing about the, the seamless transition. You actually never really want to hover at one point. If you fly approaches or missed approaches or anything like that, you always kind of have procedures to go around. You can always just go, let's say 50 kph for, for, the, for the five seater, means your energy consumption drops like almost 50% already, which makes us, again, at these low speeds, more efficient than, than open rotor designs, although the ducted fans themselves in pure hover are not as efficient. But that means in forward flight, they're absolutely efficient, or that's what they, what they basically tune for. Um, and so this is a key enabler for that, for that concept of, of uh, no, low noise on the one side and, and high uh, energy efficiency on the other side. So I mentioned we have 36 engines and um, that's not just an arbitrary number, of course. We, we tried a lot of different designs, a lot of different, uh, well, numbers and diameters and so on. And 36 um, kind of came out as a very good proportion in terms of sizing and also in terms of redundancy. So when we want to fly planes, as many as you have taxis on the road right now, you have to increase the safety level of, of what aviation is today. And even aviation today has safety levels that excel uh, basically every, every other means of transportation. But still, if you operate them in such a ubiquitous manner, um, our goal is actually to increase that safety level. And how do we do this? Um, it's a concept we call ultra-redundancy because it really means there's no single point of failure whatsoever in the whole concept. Um, and to give you an example, that the most tangible one is probably the engines themselves, where whenever a engine fails, you won't even notice. If up to three engines fails, you, you won't notice if they all fail in one, one flap, or if a flap itself fails, that's still contained. So in all these failure cases, we still guarantee a safe back transition and a safe vertical landing. So there's no, I'd say, emergency landing in the, in the classical sense where, you, I don't know, you have to pick a field and then do a forward crash landing. Um, that's not designed in our safety concept. So in our, in our whole ana analysis, it's basically always the worst case is, um, that you, that you have a flap loss, a complete flap loss, and then you still can do a back transition. On top of that, I mean, in the most unlikely case, let's say, a, I don't know, a bird strike of a whole swarm, or um, I don't know, something went wrong and you really got into a lightning or something, there's still a safety net. We still have a whole, a whole aircraft parachute on board, which will bring you down. Um, you're not going to get thrown out of the plane and then hanging in your, in your little ejected seat, but you actually have a, have a parachute for the whole plane. Um, and on the third point of the slide is also something called a flight envelope protection, um, which in fly-by-wire systems is nothing really complicated. It just means that you can't put the aircraft in a state that it's not designed for. In Traditional aircraft, for example, if you just pull up, pull up, pull up, and don't increase the throttle, at some point you reach stall, and you just drop basically like a stone. Um, that is something we can just, in, uh, just prohibit by saying, okay, we define a flight envelope in which we can safely operate, and everything else, the fly-by-wire system or the automatic control system will just not allow. So this is the, the point that I mentioned before about the maneuverability. Um, and one really, really big let's say, key, key point or key advantage of this concept that um, when we go through this transition phase, because we place the, uh, the, the engines on top of the flaps, they always guarantee a attached flow on the top of the wing. So if you compare this, for example, to the other one where there's no engines at some speed, or not speed, at some angle of the flaps, you have a detached flow, and that means it's not really controllable anymore because it's very nonlinear behavior and it's really hard to control. Um, in our case, since we kind of guarantee or we force the air to flow over the wing, 
it's a very nice concept. You have maneuverability throughout the whole transition. And on top of that, and we think actually that's a, that's a very important point. If you want to fly in urban environments, for example, or you want to, where, where, there, where there's real world restrictions, you have buildings, you have maybe a crane, um, and you might need to go slow there. You can't, like I said, you don't just want to hover but you want to maneuver in, in, in this transition phase, in low speed flight. So we think it's actually really crucial that it's not like a, from state A to state B transition where you can't really, well, you, can't, you can only go back and forth, but then like, please don't touch the aircraft in this time. No, in our concept, we don't have any restrictions in terms of maneuverability throughout this phase. So it's a, it's a, a gradual process. Um, and the other thing that I already mentioned about even at, at low speed flight, the, the energy consumption drops already compared to, to, the, uh, to the hover flight. That's because of this high lift system. So because we're sucking air over the, over the wing, um, there's a positive, uh, say, positive propulsion effect on the, on the aerodynamics itself. So if, when we model this, we always have this dependency of, well, when there's more mass flow, actually the, the wing generates more lift, more than just the, the mass flow itself generates, but actually there's a positive, um, a positive back coupling, basically. So that's, that's one of the, let's say, secrets of why our transition flight is also very, uh, very energy efficient. All right, and then the obvious thing kind of is about this whole concept about moving into the air. Well, the whole infrastructure that we struggle to build up so many times that killed projects like the Transrapid train in Munich from, from downtown to, uh, to the airport. All of these projects, and I mean, I, there's countless projects. It, actually, when you, when you drive on the motorway anywhere in Germany, you will always have jams, traffic jams, caused by construction sites. That's kind of, these infrastructures that we use today, they're just really, really, really intense in terms of cost, in terms of maintenance, in terms of time to build them up. So. This is what this slide aims to, to demonstrate, basically, when you see on the right side all these big, big constructions that you need just to support a high-speed train or a high-speed car, um, a motorway. All of this, of course, you don't need when you, when you can fly. Um, so the result of this is that you can scale much faster. You can really quickly implement or reach new use cases, reach new areas. All you have to do is basically build these spots, these spots where you can land. Um, and of course, we're not saying there's no infrastructure. Of course, you need some kind of, we call them lily pads, but they can, can be called vertiports or whatever you want to, want to call them. Basically, something similar to a helipad that we have today. Of course, we have to build them um, and we have to certify them so that it's not, it's not going to be no infrastructure, but compared to what we have today for high-speed systems, it's like a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time to actually build them up. Um, and another added benefit of actually traveling in the air, traveling faster and traveling flexibly, means that you can really increase the radius of your life. We call it basically the life radius is what you can reach or what you consider to be acceptable to travel in a day, for example. Uh, most of us have a kind of a, an acceptance level over which they wouldn't accept to come you to work, for example. For most of them, for most of us, it's, it's around an hour. Um, and so in, in one hour, you can, or here it's in this example, it's 50 minutes, um, depicted on, on a map around Munich. So in 15 minutes, with a car, you can travel like 12 kilometers, which is this, rot, uh, this red, red circle. And uh, using a high-speed VTOL network, you can just increase this five times. And this, this opens up a whole bunch of opportunities. So imagine you work in the city, but you live in the countryside. That wouldn't be possible today unless you really take a tedious commute and, um, I don't know, spend two hours each day, uh, each, each way, also um, to get from your beautiful Bavarian countryside to Munich downtown or working at BMW or whatever. So this is really a, a game changer in terms of the radius that you can access in your daily life. So here's a few, few of these points that I, I, that I already mentioned. Um, we can make states to metropolitan areas. When we increase this radius, people don't have to live in the city anymore. We can basically make Bavaria 
one big metropolitan area. So it's not going to be a metropolitan area around Munich. You can actually have whole states or whole regions. And that, that adds or that expands also with increasing battery capacity, with increasing number of landing pads. You can have that case where really you don't care if you, if you live in Augsburg and work in Munich. I mean, that's, that's an example which is already possible today. But imagine Nuremberg, Munich, stuff like that, where you wouldn't even consider this today. And this will be basically will be a no-brainer in the future. Um, it might also have a positive effect of actually other, let's say, infrastructural uh, issues. For example, nowadays, the living costs in Munich is just crazy. If you can take a bit of that pressure and, and people can actually move in the countryside and live um, or are not bound by this one factor of their commute, um, that might also have a, a very positive effect on, on living costs. Um, and the real estate prices might balance a bit. Um, and of course, the more you take out of the cities and the more also you take into the sky, the more you kind of alleviate um, the, 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 the cities from the burden of uh, having all this transit traffic on, on the ground. Um, and when you have like point A to point B in this ubiquitous case where you can really, where we say in Bavaria, you have, I don't know, let's say, more than 2,000 landing pads distributed around Bavaria. Um, you don't have to do these, these transits. You don't, imagine you live in, in Nuremberg and you want to go to Munich airport. You don't have to go, if you take public transport, you don't have to go to Munich and then back to the airport. Or even if you live, even if you live in the south of Munich and you want to go to the airport, you always have to have these, let's say, hubs in the city centers right now. If you have these, these pads like spread around Bavaria, you can really go from point A to B, point B uh, directly. And al already this takes off a lot of the burden that, that this infrastructure-bound um, transportation system just inherently have because, well, it's just, it's not feasible to build this network, which in, in our case can be really, you can imagine like a, a network where everything goes crisscrossed and then uh, you can't build this with a train network, for example. Um, yeah, and the last point, cities might become actually greener when, when that is, let's say, in 20, 50 years, I don't know, when this is a, trans, a means of transportation that we regularly use, that can take a lot of the load off the ground and, and, and cities can be a bit more breathable, a bit more um, yeah, sustainable. You don't have the problems with the diesel scandals and, and uh, all these emissions on the ground that, that you can just well, take a bit off. And also what we see right now, so this was the effect on, on society and on the way that we might experience distances. Um, what we see right now also on an economic side is there's a whole new industry. There's a whole new industry just starting to get off the ground and, and there's really a dawn that you, that, we, that, you can, that you can witness right now. So what do we see right now? We have, we have a lot of component manufacturers, people that have not entered the VTOL space before now offer to build components like sensor systems, computer systems, specifically for VTOL aircraft. We have new vehicle manufacturers basically coming out of nowhere every month, every week. There's a, there's a list on the internet where you can see it, it just adds up. There's many startups like us. Um, so when we started this out four years ago, we thought we're kind of the lonely rangers here. Like no one will believe, or no one did believe in that concept actually taking off. Um, and you would still be considered kind of crazy. Today, if you have an idea like this and you have a concept that sounds safe or sounds reasonable, um, it's much, much easier to actually get money for this. So what we see, that's also, of course, people like, like Lilium and, and, and Joby and also Airbus with the Vahana project, all of these, let's say, all of these contributed to, to the space made it very attractive. Also Uber with the Elevate program. Um, we, we really see there's a space opening up people taking it seriously uh, and, and not, not asking, oh, is this going to happen? But actually just asking, well, when is, this, when is this going to happen? When can I actually use one of these jets? When, I can, when can I actually cut down my commute time to a fifth? Um, and also cities actually preparing for, for this. So we have a lot of talks with politicians, not just in Germany, um, but in, in various cities around the world that are already now very interested in supporting us in, 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 in learning on what they can do to actually make their city part of this, of this network. And, um, 
And there's also people like Uber, like I mentioned, that don't necessarily want to build jets or aircraft. Um, they just want to leverage the fact that there's going to be vehicles out there and they need to be put in service, they need to be organized, there needs to be air traffic management around this, so the whole service needs to be established and there's lots of players entering the space um, more from the service or the provider side. And so how will this look like, the, the, the growth that we're going to experience? Um, so right now, I think a fact is that everyone wants to be connected and for, for cities it's basically like what I mentioned before, this crisscross network, it's like having a 360 degree high speed hub on your rooftop. Um, so this is why it's, of course for cities as well as for individuals, this is really attractive. Um, and the nice thing about these infrastructures is you don't, as Lilium, we, necessar we don't necessarily have to build all of these pads we can basically partner up with um, independent entities um, and they will, they will also have a big advantage of having, for example, a hotel. Let's say the Western Grand here, they would build a lily pad on top, of their, on top of their rooftop. So it would actually be in their interest to have one of these hubs on top of their rooftop because it means they get more, more people directly from the airport directly to their hotel. So this is why this idea of the infrastructure in this case is, is very, very scalable because all of the entities are actually interested in, and have a, like a common uh, interest in, in, in establishing this. Um, and the third point is that in this growth, what we will see is a very strong network effect, meaning that once you have a small network established, you can really add on top of that and um, every new connection is not like you're building one additional, let's say, route. All of the existing ones can already connect it to this new pad, basically. So it's an exponential growth also in the infrastructure side. So the whole market that we, or the whole industry that we see right now um, is really behaving like the dawn of the internet where, where growth, or basically not just the dawn of the internet, but what we see in e-commerce, what we've seen in, in, in basically all the, all the digital, digitalization, it's something similar here, just more on the hardware side, but it's also what we experience right now is really an exponential growth. Okay, so the second part of, of this uh, presentation, I want to go a bit more on the personal level and tell you a bit more about not just the vision and what we think the world is going to look like, but actually tell you a bit about how we got as Lilium where we are now. Because in the beginning, it was really just us four co-founders. Um, four crazy guys from the TU Munich um, that have been studying aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, propulsion, um, and I was the roboticist in this, in this bunch of people. Um, and when Daniel came up with that concept, uh, actually he, he had that idea when he was on a, on a, in Glasgow spending a, a semester abroad and he was at some point uh, tired of partying um, and sat, sat in his little flat and thought about future, uh, future transportation concepts. And so when he came back to Munich, he approached us and told us, as I have to tell you about a crazy idea, and my flatmate in, in Scotland uh, told me, if you can do it, then you have to do it. Um, and so he proposed this idea to us and um, I guess we, the three of us were the only crazy enough guys to actually follow him. And um, so we were all doing our PhDs at that time. Um, so that was initially, of course, a big step. Not so much for ourselves. Also a bit scary, but that was, you, you have the enthusiasm and all of this, that, that, so that you can justify this very well for yourself, but the, the talks with parents, uh, with friends, <laughs> when you tell them, well, I've quit my Academic, academia career in robotics um, to found this company. Um, yeah, it was not that easy. I mean, it was a mixture of some people really enthusiastic uh, and like the, the, the people that kind of bought into the vision. Um, but let's say 99% were just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so, so it was us four. Um, we compiled this group or to basically mirror every part of the, of the aircraft development. So like I mentioned before, we have an aerodynamicist, Patrick, uh, Sebastian is a structural mechanic, uh, mechanical engineer, Daniel, of course, is a glider pilot, knows about aircraft, studied um, um, aerospace engineering, and um, also propulsion in, in his masters. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm more 
on the robotic sides, I didn't have anything to do with aviation before I met uh, this, or before we came up with that concept. Um, but I thought, actually, if I do ground robotics, like I've done before, um, or if I do aerial robotics, I mean, the concepts are kind of similar, little did I know. But um, of course, it was uh, just a, a very challenging and very interesting, not just from the, I mean, the vision was something that just made my eyes explode, but also like what I'm gonna do on this plane, actually building a cool aerial robot, robot um, was also something that kind of the inner geek in me uh, could, uh, well, was appealed. Um, so, so it was for us, four guys, no money, uh, just quit our PhDs. Um, so what do you do? Like the first thing, well, we also didn't have any, uh, any office building or anything, we, well, because we didn't have money. So classic founder story, we just sat in Sebastian's living room, built a little office out of it. Um, luckily his, his former roommate uh, just moved out, so we kind of bought or rented out his, his living room and started working there. So what do you need as a startup? Of course you need money, right? So how do you get money? Well, you have to convince someone that you're not as crazy as everyone believes. So how do you generate that trust? Um, you have to show, you have to prove that what you think and what you want to do is actually feasible and not just that it is feasible, that, but that you are the right team to actually pull this off. So we build lots of prototypes, like small ones, big ones, ones that could fly, ones that we crashed, like countless prototypes. Um, and you see, we didn't have money, so we couldn't really build landing gears. So this was actually after a flight where Patrick and me had to catch it. Uh, but we were really happy that it didn't crash, so that was uh, one good day. Um, so yeah, we built all these prototypes with, we have to be fair, we also got money then from the TU Munich. We got a bit of money from uh, a European project, a uh, European Union project called Climate Kick. Um, and we also won an incubator um, from ESA. So, this enabled us to at least build more advanced prototypes. In the beginning, the, the glider planes that we built out of wood uh, and, and, and foil, um, of course, that was basically our own savings. Um, but then we, we could build aircraft that, that flew at least, that could take off vertically. Here they could also fly a bit forward. We didn't really manage to, to like do the whole transition at that state because we didn't have resources. It was really just me doing the simulation, writing the, the software to do this. So, no way we could really pull off the whole flight control algorithm development at that point. Um, so we used a lot of open hardware projects, a lot of open source projects, things that you can really get off the internet, get you started, show a basic demonstration. And of course, whatever has been, whatever software we've been flying there resembles absolutely nothing the software that we build right now. But of course, for, for an outsider person, for an investor, they don't really see the difference. As soon as this, no, I mean really, that's, and they don't expect you to build uh, safety critical software in these prototypes. They just want to see that what you tell them matches the reality. So you just have to, you don't have to, you don't have to tell them, well, us four guys, we're building a certifiable airplane. No, you just have to say, okay, if we get the right people and if we get the money, then we can pull this off. And, and this trust just shows in, in whatever small steps you take. So we actually found an investor that was crazy in us crazy enough to invest in us. Some of you in, in Germany, you, you might know Frank Thielen, um, because I think right now he's more on TV than actually doing startups. But um, he's a great guy, and he was really crazy enough to, to believe in us from the, big, from, from the first time. So where all of the other investors that we talked to saw hurdles, risks, um, he saw, or his team actually saw, opportunity. Um, and he, he said that one quote, which he, he cites, uh, or he cites very, very often, um, and he said, when I met you guys, my head said no, but my heart said yes. And that kind of reflects the thing that, of course, in his, he, he, he had done software all his life, so he had no idea whether, like, the technical part of it would really be as easy as we told him, or, I mean, of course, we thought it, might, it would be much easier than we now know, and, and, but he was, he was just buying into the vision, um, and he, he believed in the team, and that's the most important thing. And, so, and this was our experience throughout the whole Lilium development phase, that it's always much more important, not just the founding team, but what team you build around it. So, because in the end, there's gonna be a tons of problems that you don't foresee, that you can't expect, and that you have no idea how to solve them in the beginning. So the only thing that you can really invest in is 
getting the right people with the right mindset and the right skill set on board, um, which gives you the trust that we can tackle any problem. And of course, this expands to the investor side. So it's not so important to have the, the investor that um, has the biggest experience um, because, well, no one had, had experience in VTOL jets. Um, so it's all about this buy-in, this believing in you. And, and our second, uh, second investor, um, and I'll come to that later, um, he always prepared us for bad times, basically. He said, guys, you have been extremely lucky so far, but know that whenever you hit rock bottom, um, we're going to be there for you. And this is very, very valuable. And of course, we are in a bit of a luxurious situation because um, once we got a bit further, we could actually then pick our investors to fit to us. So this is then, then that, that basically the investors are the extended Lilium family where they share our values, they share our mindset, they share our ambition, but also kind of know what kind of crazy moon moonshot project we actually uh, set out to do. Um, so yeah, we got a bit of money from Frank, and uh, with this, finally, I could take, uh, could hire a few people to actually program the flight control software in a bit more detail. So this is actually the first prototype that we built. It's a one to five scale uh, RC piloted aircraft that I've been flying on a, on a little model, uh, model airspace, um, model uh, airport. And um, well, let's look, have a look at what this, it's called Dragon. Because it's so big. So you see, we didn't put 36 engines there because actually we tried that. We bought 36 mini, mini engines and they just popped off the first time that we, that we, that we put them on the power. So uh, we kind of had to scale the concept a bit. But for the flight controls, it didn't matter. So the whole software, the software that you've seen on the, uh, on the full scale prototype is actually the same software running on this prototype here. So now it goes into forward transition. Also in the transition phase, we do a turn. And now we're in, in, in forward flight, basically in cruise speed. Yeah, I was kind of a bit of a reckless pilot at that time. <laughs> well, the trees are much further away than it seems. Uh, and yeah, now that's also, okay, they also have another nice shot from the, from the aircraft. Here it's a, it's a nice, um, Nice state again because we're right in this mid transition phase, right? 45 degrees flat angle, um, and you still see it, you can, move, you can fly it as an airplane. Okay, now we'll see the back transition, and the back transition is actually as smooth as the, uh, as the, the forward transition. You don't really see what's happening, just at some point, it's hovering. Thanks. Well, what, one difference here, you saw that in the end I had to kind of balance it uh, so we, because there was windy, windy, windy conditions. This one didn't have a GPS lock mode in, in hover, which uh, the other one, the big one, then uh, we, we developed into. Um, okay, what happened after that? So with this prototype and the ones before and showing this transition flight and maneuverability and all of that, uh, we actually got our second investor, um, Atomico, led by Nicholas Sandstrom, which some of you might know as the founder of Skype. So that was also, he, he knew Frank, and Frank told him about it, and in the beginning he had that same what attitude, but then he met us, and um, yeah, he, he bought into the vision, he had the same attitude as Frank, and they were very, and he actually said that about the guys, when you hit rock bottom, we're gonna be there for you. So um, that was a big, big milestone for us, actually getting something in the million range um, and that actually enabled us to hire people. Before that, with the investment from Frank, we hired a few people, but it was also most, mostly investment in, in, in technology. Um, now, with 10 million, for the first time, you're like, okay, with 10 million, we can actually build a team. 
Um, so that was an awesome moment for us, a really big milestone. Um, and then with that team, we built the next prototype, which you've seen flying already, with this nice shot in a, uh, on that, on that uh, experimental test uh, area. And with that airplane, we, of course, this was much more impressive. Although from, let's say, my perspective, the flight control side, it wasn't that big an improvement or it wasn't that big a step up. But of course, for demonstration purposes, if you have something full scale flying around, um, that video that we released that you find on YouTube, um, that got a, or created a lot of buzz all around the world. So, and this enabled us in this, like with this momentum, uh, we could make the next founding run, uh, funding round. Um, and for the first time, we actually got something around $90 million. And that was awesome because that meant not just hiring a team to build the next prototype, but really thinking, thinking forward, thinking about production, thinking about the service and all of this. Because now when that, was, that investment was done by Tencent. Um, it's, uh, it's basically the Google or Facebook equivalent of, of China. Um, and the, our inve or the, the investment manager that, we are, that, that invested in us um, he's a crazy guy from, from, uh, from the Silicon Valley. Um, and he's, he's basically, he's pushing us uh, to think in, in, in ways that we hadn't imagined before. So really thinking about, okay, let's not just build, let, not, let's not just conquer uh, Europe, let's conquer the whole world, basically at that world domination uh, <laughs> kind of mindset, uh, which like, these people, when they've been working in, or seeing so much growth, so much exponential growth in their careers, that, that really inspires, uh, inspires, inspired us to think really big um, and is also helping. And, they, and they, they kind of, knowing that you have an investor that is not in for the quick money, but really believes in the vision and wants to see this through, they, all of them invested because, of course, if they had just looked at the monetary uh, reward, they had been much, much easier and, and safer bets probably. But they were in for the vision. They were in for the improvement for the world, for humankind. And these were the same values that we shared. So that, that's still, when we have board meetings, um, it's not so much always about, oh, how can we get the exit quickly or whatever. It's more about how do we scale this? How do we really make it, how do we make it useful for everyone? And this is, this is a very important thing. This first sentence that we put on the wall here, making it, make, or enabling this world where everybody can fly anywhere, anytime. So, of course, in the beginning, it's gonna be a small, say, subgroup of people for some connections, but why we set out to do this was not because we wanna build some tool for the rich, because we wanna build a, or call it democrat, dem democratizing uh, air travel, basically. So, and this is a, a sentiment that all of the investors share with us, and which is really important for us. Um, another very big milestone for us was when we moved into our own building for the first time, something like two months ago. Um, so this is a, an old building that we could, that we could uh, rent and they refurbished us for it for us and we actually put some nice lily flags here in the, in the front which gave us a bit of a, oh, this is really our space. Um, and yeah, and we can grow in this, so we can be like 300, 400 people in this building. And we're, right now we're roughly 130, 140 because we're growing every week. So we have these whole company meetings every Monday where all of the new people basically get presented and it's, it's always like five, five six people. Um, and it, it's just crazy. We hit this, this, this point where you're walking in the, in the corridor and although you're your co-founder, it's like, ah, okay, I, I, I might have seen this guy, uh, but I'm not quite sure who he is. So it's, it's really, it's an interesting, an interesting experience actually when you go to the canteen that you meet new people uh, that are actually working in your company. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's awesome having your own building, having your, basically your space um, and knowing that you can expand there was, for us was just a, a huge milestone and it just on the emotional level felt really, really like the whole Lilium family actually now comes together because before that we were kind of scattered around the business park uh, and now it's really one coherent um, development center. So what are we working on right now? What is it? I've talked about the past, I've talked about the long-term vision or not long-term because Actually, it's going to be there sooner than we think. Um, some, somewhere in the time of 2020 to 2025, um, we, we're going to have market entries of all of us, like the, not just Lilium, but there's going to be more, more out there. So this, this space that, I've, 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 uh, ref, that I was referring to is really picking up speed. Um, and there's also like the, the, the open rotor concepts like Ehang, Volocopter. 
they're already flying. Like they're already with their with their with their prototypes. Um, so this is going to come very very soon. And um, also, of course, our timeline is very uh, demanding. Um, and we're since now we have that good backing by the investors, we can actually really move forward. So what we're working on right now um, is actually building this prototype to, and the plan is to fly this this year. So having this, this prototype, this five-seater, um, full weight, full-scale prototype, um, taking off, doing transition, flying crazy maneuvers, that's our big milestone right now. Uh, and then after this, or at the same time, we're basically building up production capability so that once we have this demonstrator um, ready, we can actually build uh, a, a prototype um, that is going to be certifiable. So, and then certification takes probably another two, three, might take five years. No one really knows with these new concepts, but um, we have very good contacts to EASA already, so they are very keen on seeing these projects succeed because for them it's also something that they know it's going to come and they also want to have this technology in, uh, in Europe. So they're very supportive, and um, this is also then, another, of course, another big milestone having a certification. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was it for me. Now we have another, well, actually just 10 minutes left for Q&A. Um, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate all the questions. And uh... okay, so. Um... Actually, the slot ends in a few minutes, but um, I guess we have time for a few questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, actually, I myself am a, a pilot, and one of the challenges I have is the weather mm -hmm. and the authorities, you know, government authorities. What kind of a type rating will I need for such a device? Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, um, you know, 25 gusts uh, is not the weather type that I really would like to be flying in. How do you actually aim to um, tackle those kind of challenges? And, yep. you know, I mean, uh, my philosophy is if I can walk away from a landing, it's a good landing. If I can reuse the plane, it was an excellent landing. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we'll, would we'll appreciate your yeah. feedback on that. Um, so the first thing in terms of... Uh, weather resistance, basically. Uh, so we plan to certify it as an IFR uh, aircraft so that you are able to fly in, in controlled airspace and also in, in uh, weather conditions where uh, visual, visual, visual flight is not uh, permitted anymore. So that's, that's the first thing. In terms of the, the pilot license, um, it has to be a commercial pilot license, but we're aiming at, and also our, like the whole space is aiming at um, pilot licenses that are not as say, complicated and, and, and costly as for airliners, um, but like a reduced commercial pilot license. Okay, another question? Yeah. Air, aerospace engineer myself. Um, so can you give us a bit detail on the, so some technical details on the full-scale models of what's the maximum takeoff mass, about what is roughly the glide ratio you need to attain a range of 300 miles because probably battery technology is limited to what 30, 40, 50 kilowatt hours which you could get in there. So you need really an excellent glide ratio to actually attain that, that mileage. Thanks. Yeah, um, so without being allowed to talk about really specific data, uh, I can tell you that um, well, the takeoff mass is going to be something between a ton and a half, a uh, ton and a half, um, and the glide ratio is somewhere between 15 and 25 or something. So it's, uh, yeah, and, and the battery technology that you that you mentioned, um, of course, we're aiming at battery technology that is on the market already, uh, or let's say on the cusp of the market. So we're we're already partnering up with big battery manufacturers to get basically the latest and greatest, but also the latest and greatest in in reli reliability. Okay, so we'll have one last question so uh, people have enough time to change. I hope that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so currently there's a hot race in autonomous driving, and uh, this seems to be, from my point of view, a very difficult algorithmic challenge because there's just so much constraints in, say, inner, traf inner city traffic or something. Yeah. So from a naive point of view, it seems easier to get to autonomous airborne traffic. Um, could you comment on that? And if so, um, should like a lot of this money and effort that's currently being invested in autonomous driving go into airborne traffic? 
Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, we do foresee the same, let's say, revolution in terms of autonomy in the air. And I do agree that, the well, actually it might be easier because it's airspace is more controlled and more predictable. Um, and the airspace over Morocco looks exactly the same as it looks over Munich. So, well, depending on the weather, but the weather can also be similar in different, different areas. So you don't have to account for different cities, different landscapes. Um, all of this makes it much easier. If you can have autonomous operation with your infrastructure and you put this infrastructure somewhere else, you can have autonomous operation there basically immediately. Um, the challenges there are, of course, that right now, um, everything that is close to autonomy in the, in the, in the aerospace world uh, basically works with, let's say, airliner systems where, or let's say airports supporting automatic landing systems and all of that, which do not exist in a certified way for helipads, for example. So there, there's, there's huge challenges, but there's also huge opportunity because it's kind of a green field um, where EASA and also FAA kind of have the approach of, well, there's nothing yet, so we don't have to make, we don't have to develop it, of course. You have to develop it, you just have to show that it's safe. Um, and that might sound easy, but that's, that's the really, really hard part. Proving um, that your automatic landing system, for example, that works at all time or 10 to the minus nine. Um, so building the technology is not really the hard bit. That's basically every drone that, you, that has GPS nowadays can fly autonomously. Um, but, and then you might add some kind of detect and avoid system to it to make it more safe and so on. Um, but if you have densely populated airspace, um, you have to integrate with existing air traffic control um, and, and, and airspace management, and you have to make sure that you show compliance with certification, and the certification doesn't exist yet. Um, that's the challenging bit. That's also the reason why in the beginning, we're gonna have probably the technology kind of ready or on board uh, from market launch, um, but still operated with a pilot, so we have that transition of moving from uh, a pilot operation to a more and more automated um, operation. Okay. All right, then thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Uh, it was nice. <laughs>